Good afternoon. Uh, good morning and uh, good evening, as we have some participation from other continents. I'm uh, Giorgio Veronesi, President of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering, EFC. I've been in the board of EFC for the last uh, four, eight years, and currently I'm in, in my second year as president. I'm a chemical engineer by training and graduated in Italy, in Padova. And uh, I've been spending the whole of my career in the engineering construction business, involved in many projects, mainly abroad, with uh, several long assignments overseas. I'm very happy to be involved in the introduction of this webinar on the view on the future of applied thermodynamics, a very interesting topic. Let me say first something about uh, this uh, webinar series. Um, this started uh, during the COVID. Uh, we, we decided in uh, EFC to, ha to, to have these uh, spotlight talks in order to keep together the community during the pandemic. But the success of the previous years convinced the management of EFC to transform uh, the spotlight talks in a regular feature of our program. And this uh, spring 2023, nine of our working parties and sections which are quality by design, multi-phase fluid flow, high pressure technology, chemical engineering applied to medicine, static electricity, early career chemical engineers, crystallization and characterization of particulate systems, loss prevention, safety promotion, and today thermodynamics and transport properties have been delivering over two weeks, a short session of three or four talks focus on specific topics by leading industrial and academic experts. We try uh, to have always both uh, um, contribution, the contribution of the two sides. Uh, this, the Siri also enables attendees to sample matters in area that they find interesting, but may not otherwise have had the opportunity to attend before. And in this way, we want to encourage cross-fertilization between the specialist areas. EFC promotes a scientific collaboration, supports the work of chemical engineering in 30 European countries, representing more than 100,000 of them in Europe. The working parties and sections of EFC cover all major aspects of chemical engineering and are, in fact, the, at the core of the organization that form the scientific and the technical engine that drives many of EFC activities. I'm particularly happy in this uh, series of Spotlight Talk, that we had the first contribution of the two newest sections of EFC, Chemical Engineering Applied to Medicine and Early Career Chemical Engineers. I think that, you know, the creation of uh, new sections in uh, EFC represent um, an important way for, for us to keep us uh, up to date. Before concluding, I would like to thank all the people that work hard inside the working parties and sections and the EFC in general for this initiative to happen. And uh, in particular, I would like to thank Martin Pou uh, in Toulouse, who did uh, most of the work for this <laughs> spotlight talk, like in the previous years, from the very conceptual and planning phase to the setting up and all the practical activities. So again, thank you very much, Martin, for your hard work. I thank you for your attention. I wish all the speakers and the attendees a fruitful and successful webinar. And uh, I would like to give back the, the word to the chair of the working party on thermodynamics, Professor Maria Grazia De Angelis of University of Edinburgh to start the works. Maria Grazia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Veronese, for this very nice introduction. And uh, I am uh, I'm the chair of the working party on thermodynamics and transport properties. Uh, before introducing our speakers, I would like uh, I would like to give you a brief overview of our working party, who is formed by around sixty people, uh, both from academia and industry. Uh, we uh, are very active on, uh, on on we have several activities going on and the one we are going to talk about today is our recently published open access opinion paper which is entitled a view on the future of applied thermodynamics that was published last year in industrial and engineering chemistry research um 
Also, we are organizing a, a workshop that will be actually in the form of a satellite session at the next ECC ICAB uh, conference in September in Berlin. Uh, the title of this satellite session is the Pharma Challenge, and uh, this is organized in collaboration with other two working parties, namely the working party uh, uh, CAPE and the one on crystallization. So there will be different points of view and, and different perspectives uh, about uh, the topic of a pharmaceutical industry and uh, pharmaceutical processes. We also uh, award several awards. One was recently uh, awarded to um, a, fresh, uh, uh, a freshly graduate PhD students, and it's called the, the EFC Excellence Award in Thermodynamics and Transport Properties, and this year was sponsored by Bayer. Uh, we give uh, uh, a Michelson Award to a more established researcher, and this is normally given do, during our uh, flagship conference, uh, the ESAT conference, and during this conference we also give the GNAP Poster Award. Uh, Helmut Knapp was the founder of this series of conferences on applied thermodynamics uh, back in 1970s. The next edition, uh, I will be the chair of next edition. I will be uh, happy and proud to host uh, this uh, conference that will take place uh, uh, from the 9th to the 12th of June 2024 at the University of Edinburgh. So next slide, please. Uh, so the topic we are going to talk about today uh, with, the different, uh, with different points of view is uh, the future of applied thermodynamics, which is a topic that is very much close to our heart. We uh, as uh, uh, academics, but also as uh, uh, industrialists, uh, we uh, are looking, uh, we are facing many challenges, in particular the challenges of the sustainable development goals. So today we have a panel and a series of uh, uh, lecturers uh, coming from industry, academia, and from Europe and from the US. And in particular, uh, the first talk will be delivered by Dr. Anton Tenkate, who is from industry. He is a principal scientist at Nurian, and uh, he will talk about the challenges of the modern society and in particular, the application of applied thermodynamics in the modern industry and society. Uh, we will then uh, uh, move uh, uh, overseas and uh, the lecturer will be Professor uh, uh, Richard Elliott from uh, uh, the University of Akron and uh, he will uh, talk, uh, he will deliver a talk about models and uh, new, uh, new models of uh, new trends in, uh, in thermodynamics to describe very, very specific problems and uh, very relevant to, to the modern society. Uh, then we will deal with the problem of data, which is uh, a, a very, uh, um, you know, a very, very challenging issue in, uh, in thermodynamics. And uh, Dr. Anna Ala Basileva from NIST, again from the US, will uh, give us a broad overview on the data availability and, uh, uh, um, and management. And finally, we will finish with uh, uh, the main author of our opinion paper, Professor Jean-Charles de uh, We know that the applied thermodynamics is not only a matter of, uh, of research and of industry, but it is also a matter of education and of soft skills to be given to the next generation of chemical engineers. So um, this will be also an interactive session. So I ask you to be there until the end. Uh, to 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 be able to to answer the questions that will be given online. Uh, another thing is uh, that we will uh, um, our question and answer session will be held at the end of the four talks, so there will be no time for questions in between talks. Okay, so if you have any question, please write them in the chat. But uh, the speakers will only be able to answer them at the end of. Uh, uh, the first, uh, the first lecture. Okay, so without further ado, I'll leave the stage to Dr. Anton Tenkate. Okay, where are you?
All right. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, th thanks for the introduction, uh, Maria Grazia. Um, and I, uh, well, I'm delighted to, to present uh, on behalf of the of my co-authors uh, as well the introduction that we had in the, the view of the future on uh, applied thermodynamics. Um, this is a follow-up uh, uh, activity based on an additional survey that we did in 2020, uh, which was a follow-up of a earlier um, assessment of the industrial needs. Um, our focus uh, is maybe, well, we are based in uh, Europe, so our focus may be uh, on Europe, uh, but uh, through our extensive uh, peer network, we got uh, information uh, from all over the world. When we developed this industrial survey uh, and we published it, uh, we thought ourselves uh, that it would be good to uh, try to get to sort of an opinion on where we should be heading. What is good? What could be even better? Uh, what's maybe not so good? And um, that's uh, what we uh, put in the, the paper. And that's what we're going to discuss uh, today in the, the number of sessions. Uh, but it starts, of course, with the question, if we think that applied thermodynamics needs improvements, is it important? Uh, and well, we do think it is. Uh, and that's what I would like uh, to discuss uh, with you. If you look at uh, modern uh, society, uh, we are faced with uh, many challenges and uh, sustainability is, is one of them, but there are more of them. And following uh, the uh, United Nations, uh, let me see, why is this not working? All right, now it does. Um, the, the, we can follow the uh, sustainability development goals uh, that they define. There are 17 of them, and all of them are related uh, to improve uh, life, basically, and maintain it uh, on Earth, uh, that there are more equal opportunities for all of us. Um, following what the American Chemical Society did, um, there are a number of uh, these development goals, which really are connected to chemical uh, chemistry and chemical engineering. And they are highlighted uh, in this slide. And if you then take uh, some examples uh, of these, uh, zero hunger, we all want uh, that all humans and feet uh, and, and, and uh, animals are, are fed in a proper way. Uh, so uh, zero hunger is very important. Um, so what can uh, chemicals do in that area? Well, there are, uh, uh, possibilities to provide uh, uh, nutrition in a better way uh, to reduce um, yeah if we add materials that we uh, only added where it's needed um, that sort of things um, of course energy is one of the the biggest and most challenging uh, items uh, of these times fossil based energy supply, uh, that's where we lived on for the, the past uh, century. Um, well, we all know that fossil leads to CO2 that has an, a consequence for uh, the, the climate. Uh, so we really have to reconsider our energy uh, infrastructure. Also there, chemistry uh, and, and chemical engineering play in a very important role uh, because with renewable energy, we also come into dynamic systems where compared to the fossil, uh, the, um, the, the availability was never a real problem. Climate action is another example um, where we really are talking about design principles to make chemistry even more greener and more sustainable than it is uh, nowadays. Uh, so making use of the right renewable uh, feedstock um, be able to recycle uh, material, that sort of things. Good health and well-being comes in uh, various uh, ways. The chemical industry is very important. Think about all the stuff that we're using these days. Many find their uh, yeah, origin from uh, chemical uh, processes. We would like to keep them, but we want that to be produced in a green and sustainable way. Um, if you talk about pharmaceuticals, they are produced from uh, chemical uh, pr uh, principles. And um, 
we want them to be produced in a green way. But not only that, we don't want them to accumulate in the environment. And uh, so uh, basically, we would like to have pharmaceuticals with a low solubility. Clean water is a very important uh, one. We talked about zero hunger. Water is very much related uh, with that. Water is a source for um, yeah, um, vegetables and that sort of uh, stuff, uh, but also uh, water, of course, just for drinking purposes. Solar assisted desalination processes are mentioned as an example by uh, the chemical society. Then the responsible consumption and production is another example where chemistry plays a very important role. It's about recycling materials. It's about renewable feedstock. Um, it's about biofuels. And at the heart is the industry uh, where uh, we talk about getting more to a more sustainable green circular uh, industry rather than what is uh, the system at the moment. And all of these, uh, yeah, thermodynamics play a very, a very important role. So if you see, uh, see those uh, fields of application, you can see the uh, uh, scheme on the right, where basically we have a circulation of uh, the streams. There are resources both in terms of energy and a material. Um, and um, that is related to uh, some of these sustainability development goals, like the affordable and clean energy and the industry and innovation and infrastructure. Then through the process, we make the products or services that are being used by all of us um, and where we also want to combat some of these uh, development goals like the zero hunger, et cetera. But also you have to recycle as shown here in the um, climate action and the responsible consumption and production. The left-hand side, uh, there are some uh, highlights uh, on most important elements like energy, water, sustainable processes, uh, health and nutrition, uh, and novel materials, and we'll get to it in more detail on the next slides. So another view is this, when you uh, take a more process-centric uh, uh, view, is that we convert re uh, resources, materials, into products that we want to use for their characteristics. These products provide a certain functionality, and uh, that's uh, what we need. Um, and that's all done. Through here. The, uh, this is uh, done through a process uh, where we uh, transform and where we separate the desired products. We have waste, and maybe we should uh, try to redefine uh, that. Uh, waste, actually, maybe we should look at as uh, the resources for the next recycle of uh, the whole uh, process. So the next resources. So we talk about recycle of waste, but we also talk about end of life when products have uh, delivered what they should deliver, um, but they have to be recycled back in the process. Well, this is a, a circular process. As we all know, uh, in the end, uh, yeah, for a process to become a, in a cyclic form, we need energy input. And that is energy that is uh, actually at the core of applied thermodynamics. So if you think about the energy efficiency, uh, conversion and en energy carriers, um, uh, we want to reduce the energy consumption, which is historically high at the moment. Uh, there are principally three types of actions to reduce it. Uh, one, of course, is to reduce uh, the use, which actually means that we have to change our lifestyle. Uh, it's the best way, of course, but it's maybe also the hardest way. We should improve uh, the use. So we're talking about efficiency of energy uh, usage. Uh, and we should talk about finding alternative sustainable resources. Improving the use, uh, we should re realize that there are efficiency losses, obviously, uh, but we should also realize that any energy conversion, uh, there is a sort of a max uh, to it, uh, which is defined by the second law of thermodynamics. We should not forget about that. 
uh, finding alternative sustainable resources, we should realize that the resources that we're looking at are less, are smaller uh, and are more time dependent. So where we uh, are used to the fossil base, which sort of is an infinite reservoir almost, and now we have a dynamic system. The thermodynamics poses a very good science uh, for, for these fundamentals. And um, well, we can ask uh, many questions uh, about it, like listed here below in the, in the slide. For instance, one of them is how good is CO2 uh, as a carbon source? At the same time, we all know that we want to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. But then the question can become, is it good to use a high energy carrier like hydrogen to convert CO2? Or is it better to use this hydrogen for something else? And I think that thermodynamics can play a role to answer these rather difficult questions. I also sometimes wonder, like we are in the fourth or the fifth revolution, industrial revolution, but do we still remember the lessons from the first industrial uh, revolution? when we, for the first time, build those engines, the steam engines and that sort of things, or the second, when we got into the fossil-based and steam kind of, uh, or electrical kind of systems. Water, it doesn't go, uh, uh, well, everybody knows the importance of uh, water. It's the key element of life. Without water, there would have been no life. Um, and uh, it's, you also see in many applications uh, because it is an abundantly available uh, uh, substance. Um, but if you think about water, its behavior is very eccentric. It behaves very much different than many of the other uh, compounds. Uh, and so even though it's so very important and at the heart of many things like electrolyte solution, et cetera, we still don't know uh, its precise uh, nature. So there is still quite some room that we should improve on in terms of uh, understanding. Solvents are key in ingredients in many separation processes or also in conversions because it brings together the reactants in the right atmosphere to uh, react with each uh, other. Or it can be used for extraction or as a distillation aid. Historically, they're of course based on the petrochemical, but now we have access to um, yeah, renewables, bio-based, which are different in nature and hence also provide different kinds of characteristics. Should we make use of that different kind of characteristics? I think we should. At the same time, also new uh, kinds of solvents uh, yeah, develop like the deep arctic solvents, supercritical CO2, that sort of things. Um, of all these new solvents, the behavior, of course, need to be understood. Um, and reverse, we would like to be able to uh, have a structured search for these new solvents. If it comes to health and nutrition or biosciences, uh, life science are more and more important. But there also uh, thermodynamics play a role. It's in terms of finding the right solvents. It's in terms of uh, yeah, defining the driving forces. If you talk about a conversion or a separation, it's about phase behavior. Uh, uh, for instance, if you want to pelletize uh, a active ingredient. Uh, the thermodynamic insights, uh, particularly uh, for, for these uh, kinds of materials, uh, is, is hampered by the high complexity of these uh, systems. We talk about electrolyte uh, systems. Uh, we talk about metastable uh, systems um, with, with multiple phases. Um, but particularly, we talk about multifunctional molecules. So our old uh, good friends, like group contribution methods, yeah, uh, may not always be as applicable as we know from the fossil base. Talking about uh, novel and complex material in general, so not only the pharmaceuticals, um, we know that the renewability and circularity also provide some challenges. 
um, the chances uh, like that we make use of the moieties, the functional groups already present in uh, the uh, renewables. So should we go back first, uh, removing all the interesting moieties and make a sort of an artificial uh, fossil uh, based uh, molecule, or should we directly make use of the functionalities that nature offers? I guess we should do uh, the latter, but that also means that we have to understand those systems much better than we do these days. And as I already mentioned at the bottom, the structure product design, I think it's something that we should uh, develop on much more. Um, thermodynamics helps us to say something. If you have a mixture, what are the properties? Product design in principle is the same, but in reverse. And that brings us uh, to the advanced uh, materials uh, recovery and precision technology. Uh, so um, if you think about sustainability, we should remember that it has two dimensions, at least. One dimension is the environmental, and that's how we typically want to understand it. We want uh, to have less of an impact on our environment. But if you talk in terms of products, we should realize there's also the financial sustainability. Um, we are all a customer and we all make the choice, what do we prefer, a cheaper or a more expensive uh, product? Uh, if you have a product of equal functionality, do we choose the more expensive one if it has a better environmental impact? That's a thing that needs to be developed. Um, everything is about reduction in energy and reduction in material usage, but still at a reasonable cost level that we can accept as customers. Um, if you think about renewables at the last uh, part, I would like to, to emphasize if it comes to separations and purifications, um, we talk about the wide range of uh, systems not only it's a variety of systems, there's also a wide range of concentrations. Fermentations are typically hampered by the fact that there are low concentrations that really needs to be upgraded. So for those systems, if it comes to the design of a uh, separation, we need to go from low concentrations all up to high concentrations. And for that, we need to write models. So that brings me to the end of uh, this uh, part of the session. I hope that um, you share our thoughts that applied thermodynamics has a pertinent role in tackling the grand challenges of modern society, but I'm happy to hear your comments on it. Um, one thing that we think is that we should convey this message, um, not only in our own community, but also to Gamco engineers in general, like today, but also to policymakers, which maybe is an even larger challenge because we meet them less often. Which brings down the last question, should we raise our voice louder? And I'm very happy to hear your opinion about that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anton, for being perfectly on time and for this very, very nice introduction to the problem and to the challenges that we have to face. Now, as, as mentioned before, we will uh, continue with the next uh, talk, but uh, you have provided us with uh, uh, food for thought. So the next, uh, the next talk is about models, models and simulation, which is an important part of our uh, work and of our community as thermodynamicists. And the speaker is Professor Richard Elliott from the University of Akron in the US. Oh, sorry about that. I forgot to unmute it first. Um, hmm. This panel is stuck. Ah, there it goes. <laughs> Found it. Maybe it's just a little bit slow. Here we go. I think I've got it now. Is this block, are you able to see the slide or is this thing in the way at all? 
yeah, I see a slide with the title and the bulleted list. Yeah, on my screen, it, uh, it's showing this, you know, mute and stop video and all of that. I'm good. To, I, I'm going to assume that that's not on yours. Okay, so, no. uh, yeah. <laughs> so thanks. It's so good. It looks yeah. good. Uh, yeah, so thanks for this opportunity uh, to speak with you today. Um, I'll start my clock so that I stay on time. There's there's a lot of things that I'd like to talk to you about, and uh, they're outlined here, and I'll go over them briefly just in case I run out of time and I can't say anything about the last few. Um, the thing that has changed and the perspective that I bring is when it comes to the nitty gritty of implementing our thermodynamic principles, that usually occurs through something like a process simulator or some other kind of interface. And what it comes down to in the end is the estimates of the physical properties. You can draw a picture of a molecule, but you can't really determine much about what's gonna happen with that molecule until you know its solubility, viscosity, volatility. Those are all physical properties, glass transition temperature. So uh, I, that's my perspective on, on how to implement the thermodynamics. So I wanna to talk to you mo mostly about physical properties and the present in the context of a, a book that I just com completed and came out in February, hadn't been updated in 22 years. So there was a lot to cover the properties of gases and liquid. One of the things that we found is that for some properties, so for example, the ideal gas properties like heats of formation, there's about a 3x improvement over the older methods like group contribution methods. And so we need to know when that happens because it means we kind of need to move on from those older methods if we can do that much better. When it comes to phase equilibrium modeling, which is a big part of what we do in pro chemical process simulation anyway, things are not so different, and, uh, but there are some situations that you need to be aware of where newer models are making an impact. Moving into the future, there are Properties that we didn't get enough time to, to spend on and things that are happening very recently that are in continuous flux right now. So we didn't get a chance to really fully analyze some of those developments, but I want to touch on them here as I look to the future. And so they're listed here. Uh, mainly having to do with transport properties surface tension, impact of machine learning. I'll give one example of that. The addition of association, like SAFT model type treatment in combination with traditional ionic solution models like uh, electrolyte and RTL, that looks to be providing some new insights. And then when it all comes down to from my opinion, is improving the force fields because as we get better pictures of how the molecules are interacting, we see that we improve our predictions of those properties. So who cares about physical properties? I think we saw in the previous talk that a lot of the thermodynamics that comes about could be implemented through what we might imagine as a chemical process simulator to design how to recycle some uh, battery contents. If you want to do that on a big scale, you're going to need some process simulators. And it's going to come down to what are the solubilities in the various phases? What are the volatilities? If you want to do a distillation, viscosity, when it comes to the ionic liquids, we all heard how that comes out to be a big uh, stumbling block vapor pressure and formation energies if you need to react something. So these are physical properties. 
sometimes people talk about the processes, they don't think about the products. But if you're dealing with a polymer, you're gonna be very interested in the glass transition temperature. Well, that's, that's a physical property. Cosmetics, you need to know about the feel of it. Maybe something about the toxicity, the, the oil water partition coefficient, detergents, you need to know about the surface tension and the, um, also the viscosity might be important. Environmental engineers, again, looking for solubilities. One kind of product that we might not think about too often is, is therapeutical products. So an example is given by Carol Hall at the PPE PPD meeting last week, where she was designing a peptide to bind to this bacteria called C. difficile. From a perspective of corresponding states like TC and PC, you don't get much of an idea of how to design a peptide to bind to CD facile. But from the molecular perspective, and that's where we're seeing the biggest improvements in physical property prediction, that's just another physical property binding to a peptide. So that's where I see things going, and that's where I, I feel like there's, uh, in my mind, some degree of excitement. Let me just try to prove to you what my perspective is on this. And so I've pulled out a table from the properties of gases and liquids where I've demonstrated, here are some very well-known group contribution methods. Up here, you can see the names of them. And we're comparing to a local coupled cluster method by Polechka and Kazakov, and uh, one other quantum mechanical method. And, and what you find is sometimes there's a 10x improvement in terms of the quality of the predictions. Sometimes maybe it's closer to 8x, 3x. I think 3x is a kind of a conservative estimate. So the stumbling block for these quantum methods is when you get to a heavy molecule where there are so many conformers that it's difficult to extrapolate to what that true value is going to be. So there may be some opportunity for group contribution methods to help with that, at least in the interim. Uh, but long term, these quantum methods really seem to be taking over. When it comes to vapor pressure, the improvement over a group contribution method, I've, I've cited this one as a, an example. Again, it's about 3x. This is a transferable force field that I've worked a lot on. There, there's another transferable force field that's come out relatively recently, and the most common transferable force field, or most well known, is this uh, trap united atom potential. What we see about the trap united atom potential, though, is it's, it's not really that much better than a group contribution method. But Potoff developed uh, a method, uh, force field using a Me potential instead of a Leonard Jones potential. And although he's only tested it for about 45 different branched and straight chain alkanes, it looks to be really very good. Uh, so we're going to see some impact of that when it comes to viscosity in a slide or two later. Let me talk about the phase equilibrium modeling. Here we use the Jobert database that has recently come out, has a wide variety of molecular types, goes up to 50 bars, so we get some, some feeling of high pressure and low pressure temperature range for every binary mixture. And what we see is that the two parameter ping Robinson method, yes, it does the best, but it's only 2.6 versus 3.0 versus a one parameter model. Or if you're talking about aqueous systems, it's nine versus 10. So it's a, a pretty small difference in the amount of improvement. And remember, a lot of times we want to extrapolate these behaviors from binary solution to ternary solution. So we did some analysis of the ternary solution, and we found that the little bit of advantage you get from a two-parameter model for binary systems pretty much goes away when you extrapolate to the ternary system. The more familiar kind of VLE is the low pressure types of uh, database, and, and so this may be more familiar to you. 
So full disclosure, yes, the, the difference is more significant when you have two parameters for a low pressure database with very narrow temperature range. The uh, two parameter models pretty much went out. Again, it's a difference of 1% versus 2%. One interesting thing here was that the Dortmund Unifact method for VLE was almost as accurate at predictions in some sense uh, as some of the correlative methods. One thing we did in, in PGL 6ED is we broadened our, our coverage of liquid liquid equilibria, solid liquid equilibria, and infinite dilution activity coefficients. The IDACs can be especially important in uh, environmental types of calculations. So a method that was specifically designed for IDACs, uh, no surprise then, it comes out to be the best in predicting IDACs. And, and so it's about a factor of two better. And it means that you need to be aware of that. If, if that's what you're interested in, you should use a method that's specifically adapted to that. One thing you should also be aware of is that when H2O is the solvent, that means some probably larger molecule is going to be the solute. And the infinite dilution activity coefficient has this qualitative behavior where the volume of the solute is getting multiplied by whatever else error you have, and then you take the exponential of that. And, and so because the volume is large, you're automatically going to have a, a larger error so that you're kind of behind the eight ball to begin with. How do we overcome that? I, I'm not quite sure at this time, but I, I have trouble recommending any of these methods that have 60 to 100 percent deviation. When it comes to H2O as a solute, things are a little better, but 30 percent error is still a large number. When it comes to liquid liquid equilibria, 20 percent is, is more than we should be comfortable with, but it's better than 30%, which is what a lot of the other models are showing. And, and so I think we're making progress here. This, these methods here are essentially uh, SAFT implementations. And uh, when it comes to aqueous systems and liquid-liquid equilibria, yes, the Uniquack method with two parameters is still uh, in the lead. But this one here with, two per, with one parameter is is getting closer finally with solid liquid equilibria it's a little bit like the picture with vapor liquid equilibria because in both cases the pure component properties dominate or play a large role in in the the, the mixture equilibria so in the vle it's the vapor pressure behavior in the sle it's the melting temperature behavior so the old two parameter models, six to nine percent error. SAF model, ten percent error. So again, same picture. One thing you might want to be aware of is the PC SAF model that we evaluated from Gross and coworkers. Looks like it tends to have a problem with aqueous systems. So I don't know if you saw it in the previous slides, but similar kind of trend. And another point I would like to make is that. Even though the Dortmund method was the best by far, it was significantly better. For VLE, that's not the case for SLE. And so you need to be aware of which model works in which situation. We, I mentioned before this pot off force field uh, for the prediction or correlation of vapor pressure. An interesting thing about that is that they didn't include transport properties in the characterization of that force field. They just used vapor pressure and liquid density. Well, when you apply that force field that was not trained on viscosity and you make predictions, therefore, of viscosity, we see that the red points go straight through the, the viscosities of the experimental data by given by the curves, whereas the Trap UA force field is off by almost an order of magnitude. And that extends 
for the short in alkanes, for the long in alkanes, and even for branched alkanes, basically everything that Potoff characterized, even extending to very large gigapascal pressures. So I think that's very interesting, an improved force field, even if it's not trained on that property, can make predictions that are accurate about that property. Unfortunately, this is a new development, and Potoff's force field is not really applicable to alcohols or many of the other kinds of molecules that we need it to be applied to. So I'm leaving this as a recent development and a prospect for the future. There have been other advances with regard to transport properties, and, and I should probably, full disclosure at this moment, mention that the transport properties of the last few chapters in properties of gases and liquids, and, and the clock was running out. So we didn't do as much with transport properties as I would have liked to have done. Um, so another method that's, that's been making good progress is this entropy scaling concept, using uh, entropy scaling as a surrogate model, at least, to interpolate between state points and state conditions. And we've seen some pretty good progress recently in, in that field. And one way is just a, a better scaling correlation. And another way is to combine the results of molecular simulation with a few data points on the curve and adjust those simulations to characterize the entire behavior of the entire state space. The last chapter in properties of gases and liquids is the surface tension. And again, we didn't get much time to look into the latest methods in uh, square gradient theory and density functional theory. So uh, I'd like to do more with that. And Mejia has, has published a model that's open source that everybody can use to explore that in a better way. Finally, well, not finally, but near the end, the machine learning, everybody's excited about that. There was a method presented at the PPE PPD last week that I thought was very interesting. And if you kind of integrate the area underneath this uh, blue curve, you could see that their predictions are somewhere in the area of, in the vicinity of 15% of error maybe for their Miles to properties transformer compared to a group contribution method that they selected. And, and so that's pretty close to that 15, 10 to 15% deviation that we saw with the speed and B model. Not quite as good as the pot off model, but applicable to many, many more molecules because their method has been characterized for 13,000 compounds compared to 45 for pot off. I mentioned at the beginning that the interest that I have in combining association models with traditional activity models for electrolytes. And what we see is that the accuracy is now extending to much higher uh, ionic strengths. And, and so I think that's interesting and deserves a closer look. A method that I've been working on myself lately so it's a paper that came out in 2022, is the idea that you can factorize the, this rho delta quantity that appears in these fundamental SAF equations. And when you do that, you infer an individual inherent acidity and basicity for the individual functionality, like an ester or a chloroform. One of the things that you can get from that is better predictions. And another is uh, an interesting characterization of VLE and excess enthalpy. The VLE is kind of insensitive to that solvation energy because you can adjust the KIJ to make up the difference. But the excess enthalpy is very sensitive to what that solvation energy is. And, and so you can clearly identify what the uh, acidity or basicity is when you combine these two properties. I wanted to talk more about force fields. There's a uh, a review article here. I'll, I'll just let you look at that if you want. The basic idea from my perspective is 
any transferable force field that you develop, you also need a surrogate model that essentially interpolates from state to state because every molecular simulation is essentially one single state condition. So without a surrogate model, you can't really apply that force field. In the case of the speed and D model, it comes out as a help equation of state and we know exactly what to do with that in a process simulator. In the case of a continuous force field, it gets more complicated, but I like this method called MBAR. And, and basically what it means is anywhere you see the light here, you can vary your epsilon and sigma and recompute all of your properties. Similarly, you could vary your temperature or your density within a range like that and recompute your properties without needing to do the simulation. So that plays this role of what perturbation theory was in speed and D, the M bar is in continuous force field modeling. And this should give us the ability to really improve our force fields. What should those force fields look like? Uh, there's a talk about that on the Adam seminar, where the, you get the idea that where we are now with our pairwise additive potentials, is we have some picture like this. We, we've captured the basic sketch of what the thing looks like, but to fill in the details, that's where we can use something like int uh, artifi artificial intelligence or machine learning. That's the way I see that role coming out. We've talked a lot about this uh, paper here and, and a view to the future. There's a whole issue that I helped to spearhead in IEC art just last year that has 18 different articles on various topics about databases, uh, surfactants, polymers, confined thermodynamics, electrolytes, database, <laughs> set databases, and work times theory, bio, process simulators, and Cosmo RS. Nobody's talked about Cosmo RS. So all of that is here in this issue. Our idea was that this would be a kind of a milestone that people might look at as, as a snapshot in time for a lot of these different thermodynamic methods. So that brings me to my conclusions. And uh, I'll just uh, let you look at those if you need to, and, and then uh, take any questions you might have. I'll be happy to entertain those in the chat or and save those up maybe for the, the panel session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Elliot, for this huge effort. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I am waiting for the properties of gases, liquids, and solids. <laughs> because I am a polymer person, so <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so uh, this uh, really takes us directly to the necessity uh, to have good data. And our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Ala Basileva from NIST, and she is going to talk exactly about this. So I'm sh I'm trying to share my screen. So can so can you see my screen? Marie? Perfectly, perfectly. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for. First of all, I want to thank uh, uh, the organizers for inviting me to present at this webinar. Uh, I will share some information about uh, which may be helpful for those who need data. I will describe some of our activities to uh, in, we do to provide uh, thermophysical, uh, thermodynamic information to the community. I will share some challenges we face as well as possible solutions. But before I start my talk, I must, uh, as a government employee, I must uh, show this disclaimer about using trade names in my presentation. Uh, the heart of our operation at uh, TRC is a large, constantly growing uh, database of thermophysical properties. Currently, there are, uh, uh, we have 8.6 million data points for pure compounds, binary mixtures, ternary mixtures, and reactions. And it includes, covers more than 100 various thermophysical properties. We collect data from open literature. We assess the quality of data, do some mathematical processing, and we constantly improve methods to and our technology technologies to, to collect data and assess the quality. For example, we do a lot of modeling or involving new IT technologies to improve the data discovery and process, processing. 
Uh, the, you may think that this data collection is kind of a routine operation, but it's really, it's very expensive and time consuming operation and it requires a lot of expertise. Uh, we need to balance our output, and our balance is a free and paid products and services. They are shown on the right side of the of the slide. Uh, and uh, the uniqueness of our operation is that we uh, trying to affect the situation in the field through active uh, collaboration with various parties. Uh, with researchers, with the publishers, journals, uh, organizations like APAC, and the goal is to improve the efficiency of research, data reporting, and analysis. Uh, Accurate property data are needed by industry, and errors in, in, in data can have really bad consequences from increased cost of production to uh, compromised safety of plants, like the case shown on the slide, the explosion of the distillation column, either due to incorrect or missing really information. Uh, the data are typically published in open literature, uh, journal articles, reports, theses, and many other sources. And when you need this data, you typically go to search engines shown on the slide or to some specialized uh, com data compilations like reference books, reviews, databases. Some of them are shown on the slide. Uh, PGL, which described, contains some uh, uh, review of data compilations and also some articles by by Sumnish Gupta and his co-workers co contain a good review of such compilations. But you immediately face challenges. When you search, see, search data, you see a lot, of, uh, a lot of irrelevant information and you need to filter out. And none of the resources give all the required information you want to get. On the other side, we as data, data compilers, we've, we need to get as much information as possible. You want some specific information. We need to get as much information as possible. So we face some additional challenges. And uh, one of the first challenge we face is the exponential growth of thermophysical data, which is even faster than in science in general. And what, what, what is more, we observe some shift in the production of data from traditional countries to newcomers, which affects somehow the quality of published experimental data. Uh, despite of this growth, we have uh, uh, on the very few compounds with complete data coverage. Most of the compounds don't have any data, and these are millions of different compounds. And uh, some of the compounds have just one single point, which is irrelevant for industry, for example, refractive indices. That is why the coverage is, is really a challenge. The other challenge we find is, uh, is how to find data we, we, we need to capture. And there are thousands, thousands of various journals which publish thermophysical data. And they are popping up like mushrooms after rain every, every day. And the information can be, the thermophysical information can be published in any of any journals, even unspecialized journals, like those examples I show on this slide. Or the, the, they can be published uh, in sources which are not easily accessible, for example, uh, microfilms or uh, some uh, single copies in a library which, are affect, which, which is affected by war. Uh, most journals do not see thermophysical information as something worth publishing. That's why scientists try to wrap uh, them into scientifically shiny publications. And it's really difficult to guess the existence of those data just looking at the abstract titles shown, some of them are shown in the slide, or abstract. Uh, and uh, sometimes the data is simply hidden inside the, the article, so they are not easy to locate. The next challenge, if you find the data, sometimes we even cannot capture those data or cannot interpret the data. Uh, just, uh, there are, for example, some just bare statements that the data are published to, to, to prove some scientific concept, but the data actually not, not published in the paper. Or there are some just only plots or smoothing equations. Sometimes the data are not well defined. For example, densities are reported without any specifications of temperature. 
currently, most of the experimental measurements are com computerized. So the raw experimental data are in machine readable form. However, the journals still have some old uh, publication technologies. So the authors need to handcraft some fragmented tables they, for example, the one I showed on in the middle of the of the slide, and they spent a lot of time uh, to construct this table. We, as data compilers, spent a lot of time to decipher this table. Simple table like the one shown on the right are very very useful for for those who who collect data and very convenient for use, but they are quite rare in 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 modern publications, unfortunately. Uh, so it's clear for you why graphs and plots are not good way of representation of data because the uh, you you need to spend a lot of time to digitize the plots or uh, you lose and, and you lose also accuracy of the data. But uh, what's wrong with smoothing equation? And here is an example which shows just one single typographical error in equation smoothing equation can ruin the whole data set. And even if the errors can be fixed just by guessing, the still the smoothing equation lose the important statistical information about the number of experimental points used to construct the equation and their data scatter. So that is why that is not a good way to present data. The next challenge we face is data quality. And there are three major contributions to this is lost or not gained research tradition of high quality measurements, poor or insufficient peer review, and complete or general ignorance of uncertainty. If we talk about uh, the first one, so there are many contributions to this. For example, the use of, of commercial instruments, which are black box, and that is why no, uh, no need for high qualification of, of workforce to do the measurements. Or researchers spend too much time to do the fundraising instead of doing the actual research. And unfortunately, uh, authors see the number of publications as the, uh, the metrics of scientific success while this is a bad incentive because it has nothing to do with data quality. And unfortunately, there is absolutely no consequences of, of uh, publishing poor quality data because uh, the reputation of researchers is not affected by that, unfortunately. And uh, quality of peer review is again a question of qualification, motivation, and time given to do the review. Uh, if we're talking about uncertainties, uncertainties are frequently not provided, or if they're provided, they are completely unjustified, unrealistically low, and hence, hence they mislead data users about the uncertainty, about the quality of the data. Uh, can the situation be changed? I believe yes, but we need active collaboration on various levels to, to change the situation. And uh, Let's let's go challenge by challenge. So talking about the the amount of data and coverage, the data growth is great, but it must be directed towards the industrial and community needs. Unfortunately, uh, industrial needs are frequently confidential, but at least identification of problems or identification of areas of industrial importance would be really helpful. What is more, it's we need to improve the communication between the researchers and the uh, the engineers, data users. So so there is more com communication between. So so there is more more connection, and uh, so we can improve the coverage in the field. The next challenge is about data discovery. It's really tricky. We need to either or to do both to develop the the technologies to extract and find the data, like for example, using natural language processing, or to improve the way the data are reported, uh, 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 the, the data are provided. Uh, for example, uh, by working, by, by motivating authors to, to make the data more visible or working with publishers so they have more rules on how the experimental data are abstracted in the, in the paper so they're more visible or separation of result and discussion section, section, it's really difficult, difficult question how to make this work, working. The next challenge about the data presentation, uh, we see a lot of data which are lost because of incomplete or inaccurate, uh, they're inaccurately reported. 
Funding agencies, publishers, reviewers can affect the how the data content, data, data representation in, a, in an article to be published. But unfortunately, data users have no such effect because they are typically not serving as reviewers for, for articles. So the, 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 their, their voice is too late when the paper, paper and data are published. That is why we started this IUPAC project on good reporting practice for thermophysical property measurement to provide a strong one-time message from data users for, to data, data producers about the importance of raw experimental data and uh, the, how the data should be reported so they are usable, usable by those who need the data. Uh, and uh, we started this project, we published a technical report in, in uh, pure and applied chemistry, there were 22 participants from industry, academia and government agencies in this project, we formulated nine principles of good data reporting, was grouped into three big groups shown on the slide, but this report is not just a list of principles. Uh, every principle is illustrated by a number of various examples commonly found in the literature, more than 40 various, various examples altogether in the report. But we are not stopping. We, we try to make these GRP principles vis visible. So they, we are promoting them, them through various channels, for example, through publishing of feature articles in, in the official magazines of IUPAC and, or ASHE shown on the slide, or organizing workshops at, uh, co uh, at different conferences like the one we had two weeks ago at PPE, PPD. We are not stopping here. The, uh, here is kind of how we can improve, uh, make it, uh, can we make step, steps further to improve the situation? So we have this GRP, but they are not frequently working because researchers are not motivated to, to, uh, to use GRP. That's why how we make this, this more efficient. One of the ways is to, to educate reviewers about 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 importance of GRP, and so they can they can affect the publication before it's accepted for uh, data before they accept it for publication. Another way is to make the data much, uh, published in machine readable form. But this is a very ambitious uh, ambitious uh, uh, initiative. It will require a lot of investment to develop this machine readable format. But th I think this is a really good way forward in in to, to address this challenge. Uh, the last challenge about data quality in our operation, we'll use a lot of uh, validation methods to assess quality of data. And they are published in a recent JCT paper shown on the slide. Uh, it starts from analysis of the content of the paper, uh, methods, samples, and so on and so forth, through comparison with literature, analysis, uh, comparison with endpoints, through more complex application of models, consistency checks between properties and within series of compounds. All of these checks are available and implemented in our, in, in our tool, Thermodata Engine. Uh, uh, the uh, the idea, question to the audience may be, would the audience be interested to have this thermodata agent without a database, uh, but if with all these methods for you, for, uh, for use, for validation, your own data? Would it be useful for you? Uh, here's just one example of application of such tests uh, using uh, equation of state for the revealing some outliers for properties which cannot be identified just if you use single properties, uh, single property only. And in this case, the yellow, the lower part of the slide shows yellow points, which are outliers, which only were possible to identify if you apply uh, all other properties through equation of state. Uh, one of the ways to improve the quality of data is to educate researchers about uncertainties because, uh, because uh, there, are, there are some generic uh, guides for uncertainty, but they're too generic and difficult to use. That is why we, uh, we um, initiated one more IUPAC project to develop a series of workshops to provide some practical knowledge how to ass assess uncertainty of phase equilibrium data and to build, build uncertainty budget. Here is an example of just uh, uh, building an uncertainty budget for sim simple measurements of solubility of gas at single temperature and pressure. You can see how many 
many different contributions need to be considered. It's a very complicated task to assess uncertainty. Uh, one of the way to improve the data quality is make the instrument instrument measurements traceable, and this can be done through providing reference lists for validation and testing the instruments. Uh, there are many many reference systems for various kinds of measurements, but not for phase equilibrium measurements for mixtures. That is why we started one more IUPAC project to develop a reference system for LLE, SLE, and VLE. Uh, the progress of the work is shown on the slide. The reference systems selected are shown on the slide. For each system, we provide the data used for developing the recommendation where all rejected sources are clearly identified and the reasons why they, they were rejected. Smoothing equations are provided with the parameters. And finally, numerical tables with data, reference data with uncertainties. You can see some of the equations may be quite difficult to use. That is why we developed an online calculator uh, for to support researchers so, so they can quickly do the get the reference values for their selected systems, conditions, and with uncertainties. It's a very easy to use tool. It's online. Uh, one of the uh, items uh, affecting data quality is poor peer review. Uh, it's really difficult to find reviewers to do to do the the proper assessment. Very few reviewers provide good quality reviews, and many many problems are missed and published as a result of poor review. And uh, many there are many. Uh, there are no instructions given to reviewers how to do the, the, the review, what should be checked, how data should be presented, so what, how results from specific methods should be, should be analyzed. There are no such instructions. That is why the goal of our future IUPAC project, we already submitted a proposal for this, is to affect this stage by providing checklists for reviewers uh, to improve the quality and reliability of published data. Uh, and the checklist may be just common checklist for all paper, all different kinds of measurements or for specific, for specific system, property, or method. So this is our future project. He, this slide summarizes our uh, the activities towards improving data qu qualities. Uh, quality. I just want to uh, remind that our group is involved into collaboration with, with five major journals in the field to assess quality of data uh, before they accept it for publication. And I believe this is quite successful project. project. But uh, we have an ambitious goal, a task to, to scale the separation to more journals because there are ma many more journals which publish data. But we need to do a lot of development because we cannot just uh, invest more into doing this manually. We need to develop some automatic procedures to do the data quality. And this is quite ambiguous and uh, ambitious and very difficult task for us for the, and goal for, uh, for the future. Uh, finally, so when you get the data, when you assess the quality of the data, you as a data users, you kind of uh, need the equation uh, uh, of this property as a function of state variable. You can either develop this equation by yourself or find published equations or find a provider of such data. For example, it can be process simulator or some specialized providers. Deeper provides data for pure, compound, uh, pure compounds. Uh, we on Dortmund Data Bank provide equations for pure purists and mixtures, there are some other providers. And uh, uh, our equations, which we provide, are automatically generated and they are uh, con we constantly improve our procedures and uh, methods to do this automation more efficient and uh, to provide more uh, better equations for you. Uh, in this talk, I presented some, uh, some overview of our activities and challenges with data. And uh, I, if you have any thoughts about how the situation with data can be improved, uh, uh, please, uh, or if you have any ideas or potential collaborative projects, you can contact me either today or write to me uh, in the future. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Allah, for this very, very interesting and uh, uh, very, very useful talk, I must say.
now we uh, are a little bit uh, uh, behind schedule. So I will just leave the stage to uh, Professor Jean-Charles Dentin, who is going to uh, close our uh, uh, seminar program uh, with uh, uh, a talk about uh, education, training, networking, the soft skills needed to go forward. And after his talk, we will be ready to uh, take all the questions you may have. Thank you, um, Maria Grazia. I hope uh, you hear me fine and that you see my screen. Yes, I guess so. Yes, <laughs> that's it. Yes. Uh, good. Okay, so uh, thank you. I will try to be short also because I have not many things to say. <laughs> Uh, my job is a little uh, unusual because uh, uh, I'm going to talk about soft skills, uh, which I believe are essential also in our uh, in our uh, activity, uh, but um, but uh, which I'm less used to to to, to talk about. Uh, so this is okay. Uh, uh, a view of the of the poster that we had on on the MPP, EPPD, which uh, we've talked about uh, quite a bit, and uh, you see there are quite a number of uh, participants in this in this paper, uh, and we, I'd like to acknowledge all of them for their uh, for their input because it was truly a, a, a collective a collective work. So um, yeah, PPVPD is is uh, well. We we uh, a number of us met there a few weeks ago, uh, and it was a very interesting uh, place where we could uh, share. Uh, and among other things, we've shared uh, on this on this poster. As you see, the poster brings up the the, the topic in in four big pieces. And uh, this is why today we also have had four presentations. Uh, one on the on the, the the reason why we are doing all this uh, fields of application, and this is Santone uh, who has very nicely uh, summarized this. Uh, then we have two big blocks here uh, that uh, provide the tools uh, that we that that they are um, th thanks to which we can we can do our, our job, uh, which are the modeling tools and then the data, uh, both. Of of which are of course of, of key importance uh, and then uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about the, the, the people okay because we are not going to do anything if you don't have uh, adequate uh, and educated people who can who can uh, uh, give some some input on on, on the future uh, but yes I mean uh, when I listen to uh, our discussions at uh, in Tarragona uh, I heard a lot said about AI about artificial intelligence uh, so uh, the question now may, be, may come, you know, what uh, are people really necessary? Uh, what is the role of the computers versus the humans uh, in the future? And perhaps that is the, that'll be a kind of the the, the 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 question that I want to to try to give some some elements about. And uh, I mean, very personal, um, uh, yeah, and that we can also debate later on. Uh, so, um, yeah, soft skills, people, funding. I will also start with EFCE and working party issues. Uh, first of all, EFCE, uh, I want to say where, where all of this comes from. Uh, and I think that this, this paper by Ghani, uh, who was the prior um, uh, president of, of EFCE, uh, shows, shows quite nicely with a multi-layered view of chemical engineering uh, what we are talking about. Uh, of course, we are talking about uh, multi-layer in the center of the of the multi-layer. We have the process itself, uh, and um, uh, the the farther we go from the center, uh, here we have we have more the the the, the, the signs and uh, even surrounding the signs. While well, we have the society that that we uh, that, that we all uh, care about. And from left to right, you'll be able to see the, the resources that are being uh, transformed into products. So resources may be from on societal level, uh, the demand, the availability. Um, uh, and when you go to scientific uh, resources, you go to, to, to codes and, and, and data sources uh, before you, you enter into the process. And then the pro process produces of course, products and waste, as, as Anton also showed very nicely. Uh, but thanks to scientific tools, we want to uh, improve these products and perhaps uh, reduce the waste uh, in order to, at the end, uh, produce uh, some service to the society. And that is that is really the, the, the end product of our 
of our uh, discipline. Uh, and then from the bottom to the top, you will see uh, more the, the soft skill, if I can say, soft skill type of um, uh, input. Uh, also, on the, in the, in the, at, at the entrance, of course, you find minds, you find people, you find uh, uh, yeah, people who think and who will propose some integration, some integ integrated ideas uh, to get into science and engineering. Uh, and then, of course, the fundamental principles. We know that's very much in thermodynamics, the first and second principle who are driving the process, uh, design, control, operation. Um, and at the end, you go to, to, to the actual needs of society, which is a stable technology uh, and sustainable development, uh, so even on a, on a wider scale. So this is a kind of a summary of, of what we as chemical engineers are working on. And I think uh, thermodynamics is, is, is really at the core of, of, this, of this view. So uh, as uh, Maria Grazia also introduced, uh, we have had uh, several, uh, several, several uh, uh, well, uh, realizations in our in our working party, and one of which that I want to, uh, the first one that I want to mention is the one that was published ten years ago now, well, thirteen years ago, if I, uh, in, in fact, uh, by Eric Hendricks and co-workers on the industry requirements of thermodynamics and transport properties. This was a survey, and at the time we had about thirty uh, companies. That that had, been, that had answered our survey. And at the end, we uh, concluded from this paper that, uh, well, we really need more interactions between academia and industry. And as a result of this uh, outcome, we decided to, uh, to, to, to have these seminars that we call IUT, Industrial Use of Thermodynamics. Uh, and uh, I have, we, have all, we have published or the, the results of all of these seminars, which are in fact, uh, uh, well, there, there are a number of presentations and then a roundtable discussion. So there is a lot of food for thought uh, that that has been uh, uh, that came out of these uh, seminars. And if I can summarize in in one word, I would say the the learnings from each one of them. Uh, I can say that in 2012 in Lyon. Uh, well, we've talked quite a bit about the, the virtuous triangle uh, in order to, uh, to, to have a successful uh, collaboration. That means we should not only have academia and industry, but also software vendors who are really uh, the, the, the ones who are going to, to, uh, to, to transform the, 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 the innovations that may come from academia into industry. Uh, so, so there is a real link between the three, the three partners that we need to, uh, uh, to work on. In Eindhoven, uh, we, we the, the topic of the of the IoT was keys for innovation, uh, and uh, uh, at the end it also came out in a triangle form. Uh, that means uh, we need theory, we need data, and we need simulations, uh, simulation tools. This this is also molecular simulation. Uh, these three types of um, uh, pieces of information will allow us. To, uh, the, to, to develop uh, equations of state who are, who are made available to industry through simulators. And this is really uh, what, what drives, I would say, the innovation. Uh, in Nice, the triangle became a, multi a polygon <laughs> uh, when we talked about cross-discipline collaboration. Uh, we had a very nice uh, discussion uh, with, uh, with other working parties uh, in this context. And we found out that, yes, I mean, there are many, many different uh, uh, fields of the, who, who, uh, who need to collaborate in order to, to get to success. Thermodynamics is, of course, one of them, but uh, politics, business, market are also uh, need also to be included in the, in the global picture. Uh, and that means that we need to be able to talk to each other. And this is far from being a straightforward uh, issue. Uh, in Barcelona in 2017, uh, we had a discussion uh, with, um, uh, well, the, 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 the end responsible, I would say, of the, of the process development. Uh, and uh, we thought of what, it, what is, you know, um, uh, the responsibility of uh, the people who are going to provide the tools, in particular the simulator tool. Uh, but the simulator contains, of course, a model. We talked about an equation of state and contains data. Okay, but what's the responsibility of the quality of the data and what's the responsibility of the model uh, extrapolation, but perhaps capacity uh, in order uh, um, to uh, within this simulator, uh, because at the end, the process developer uh, will essentially only uh, trust the, their, their simulator. 
Uh, and at the end, we had the last IoT in Paris. I mean, Paris, <laughs> it was really online, uh, but uh, it, it was meant to be to be held in Paris on electrolyte uh, thermodynamics. And here, the main topic of discussion was uh, was around complexity. Uh, what is the adequate level of complexity concerning uh, co considering that we have uh, that we have, of course, to worry about properties, about uh, various phases that may exist or not exist, uh, what models to be used, and what is the composition that we are dealing with. Uh, so, uh, in, depending on on the on the on these questions, well, we may we may we, we need to go to a very complex models or perhaps simplify things uh, more than yeah more. Uh, so, so these are so, some of the outcomes of the IoT seminars. Uh, and at the end, um, we decided in 2020, uh, I mean, 10 years after the first uh, survey paper, uh, well, to publish another one, uh, to make another survey. And George Contujorgis was, was our leader uh, in that context. Uh, and in this uh, in this uh, result, in this work, uh, we we compared with the, the progress with uh, 10 years ago. And well, we found out that, well, in terms of models, there was, of course, an improved uh, fur further more use of, of more modern equations like SAFT, but uh, not, not, nothing really major. An increased use of molecular tools, certainly. And of course, data data remained uh, essential in, 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 our, in our work, that is, that is clear. But what we, what we also found, found out was that new thematics came up. Uh, and that means that we needed to have more uh, further view on, on systems and properties. Uh, new systems, typically tip, new solvents that, that, are, that are investigated electro, with, with a stress on the electrolytes and on macromolecules, which is uh, really one of the two issues that, that, that uh, remain, uh, I would say, at, at the forefront of the, of the difficulties uh, that we encounter today in thermodynamic modeling. Uh, new properties, in particular, everything that occurs around interfaces, nanomaterials, non-equilibrium properties, and of course, conditions, the, the extreme conditions in particular in terms of pressure temperature, but also in terms of composition, that means uh, infinite dilution it may also be a very big issue. Uh, and of course, we also had a, 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 a third, uh, we also up with with new technologies um, uh, that come up that appear uh, and that we have to deal with that we have to learn from uh, new communication tools open science and artificial intelligence which is which is a big thing uh, that we need to have to deal with because there are certainly things that we can learn from them but there are also uh, uh, perhaps wrong uses that we need to avoid uh, for all of this we need we need people uh, we need people, that means we need uh, minds, we need education, uh, but also we need funding and we need partnerships. Okay, these are two of uh, also UN uh, development goals uh, that uh, are not technical, but I believe are also crucial uh, in order to promote, uh, to, to continue our work. Uh, so let me focus a little bit on, 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 this, uh, on this education things. Uh, I mean, thermodynamics is uh, fierce people away. Uh, you know, thermodynamics is old fashioned, thermodynamics is complex, so nobody really wants to go into, into this. Uh, so how, how, can we, how can we react uh, in front of this? Um, I believe we have to motivate our young people uh, and motivation comes from, well, love. <laughs> First thing, uh, feeling of satisfaction after success. That was actually one of the issues that came up uh, very strongly um, in our working party when we asked uh, uh, or the, the, the people around the table uh, what was their motivation for um, you know for doing the job that we are doing and yes we like it you know that is that is a very good uh, argument I think uh, a second argument is uh, is well we want to be useful you know after all we are engineers uh, there are many applications as anton indicated uh, so, cons con cons around sustainable de development uh, so uh, thermodynamics will will is, is essential in, in in many of them uh, and well at the end there is a need to to to, uh, to, to live uh, so we need to find a job and uh, so um, uh, we believe that there is there is there are jobs in thermodynamics uh, but what about the complexity? 
before we get to that point of loving our field, uh, we need to, to learn. And that is sometimes a, a difficult thing. And for this, I think we need to, 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 um, to uh, uh, see, see the, the, the educational issue in, in two big, uh, two, have two different strategies. Uh, one, which is to say that the general engineer uh, most engineers need to have a minimum knowledge. They have to, 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 uh, to be able to, uh, to know what we are talking about. They have to be able to understand the concepts in order to participate to collaborative work. They have to be able to know their role and their limits. Uh, this, is, this is in order to, to reply to the, this, this uh, argument that we had in Nice on you know, the process engineer. Uh, of course, he knows thermodynamics through his process simulator, but he must know that the simulator contains only equations with parameters and that these parameters have been obtained through uh, on lab data. So, so knowing that this, this, is, this, this comes from someplace else, um, makes it possible for him to, uh, or, uh, to, 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 uh, yeah, to, to go and talk with the people who have done the work. Uh, and uh, yeah, a good way to to uh, uh, to address the problem of complexity is also to look at you know what is the level of complexity that is really needed uh, in front of one's uh, particular problem. Uh, but we also need experts. We also need people who are able to uh, to, to understand the complexity and go and go beyond the pure uh, the pure application. Uh, we need people in academia uh, to pursue the development and to develop uh, new new tools. Uh, but we also need people in the industry, uh, and that this is perhaps uh, also one of the things that that we identified in our in our discussions. That was not enough. The case uh, we need industrial experts. Uh, there is there are job opportunities for our um, uh, for our people who are who have a diploma uh, in industry, because otherwise people the industry won't innovate. Otherwise industry will have lots of difficulties uh, debottlenecking or uh, avoiding accidents. So we need lifelong education as well. Uh, just a slide on education. Uh, education means not filling a vessel, but it means kindling fire. Uh, so it is really much more about inspiration than about filling a, a mind. Uh, so um, what I like saying uh, when I when I when I, when I like uh, I mean doing when I uh, uh, teach is essentially uh, thinking about this 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 um, uh, Bloom's taxonomy. So, so I identify clearly where I stand. What what do we need for the, the students to uh, to uh, to be able to do uh, and use these verbs uh, in order to uh, uh, clarify what we where we want to bring the students. Uh, where do the students start from? Um, where do I want to bring the students? What are they able to do, create, analyze, apply, understand, or simply remember? Uh, of course, I won't bring them the same things uh, in the, along the different, uh, uh, depending on what I want to bring them. So we need to construct scenarios, teach, interrogate, quiz, and so on uh, along these lines. Uh, so um, second thing is partnerships. And I believe uh, this is also something we learned in, uh, in Tarragona two weeks ago. Uh, we need to create community. Uh, people can be very mind, very bright uh, on their own, but if they are not together, we won't, we won't reach anything. And for this togetherness, we need to enjoy being together. Uh, and there are several tools for this. Uh, of course, training sessions, summer schools, conferences, workshops, uh, spotlight talks are, of course, part of the topic. Uh, there are ways to communicate, uh, I would say, more, more generally. So publications, handbooks, websites. Uh, this is a website that we've created on how to choose your thermodynamic model. Uh, I don't have time to, to talk of that. Uh, but also consortia, GIPs, collaborations. Uh, now, drawing funding for collaborative work, uh, in fact, again, I believe when I thought of this issue, um, I think we should go beyond our, uh, our, our, um, yeah, our triangle and look at the public at large. But that's, this can be uh, very, very wide in terms of uh, who, whom we 
talking about. The public is, uh, well, funding, because if you want to get funding, we need to, to, uh, to talk to public funders. Um, that means encourage partnerships. They accelerate, they are accept low TRLs, which is nice for us. But then thermodynamics is often perceived as perhaps too fundamental or old or easily available in simulators. So it is sometimes difficult to, to convince public funders for, for getting, uh, you know, getting work. And, and, and uh, this is related really to the, to the perception of the general public on, on, uh, on uh, and, and therefore the political decision makers, because all of these are related, I believe, is, uh, you know, we need to have the correct keywords to talk to them. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that this, the solu technically sound solutions are socially accepted and not in my backyard is one of the, uh, yeah, it's one of the drawbacks that we have to, to, uh, to, uh, to fight against. Uh, and of course, also that technically unsound solutions are to uh, so avoid that technically unsound solutions are promoted in political agendas because that is that is worse. Um, we also have industrial uh, decision makers that we need to talk to, as Anton indicated. Uh, consortia, a way to network. Uh, so it is a way to. It's it's. These are some arguments that that may that they may uh, hear, and and uh, I think it's important that they know that they, that uh, these consortia are able are are positive for their for their business. Uh, there is no quick solutions, and of course, industry often like quick solutions. Um, there is le le there may be fear of loss of uh, uh, industrial property that we have to 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 uh, to be careful about. Uh, avoid, I mean, avoid this. There should be internal experts uh, in uh, so in industry uh, in order to drive the need and to drive the academic uh, world as well. Uh, and the final thing is, of course, the young professionals. But I already mentioned this. Um, the can be the young professionals sometimes they may think of people who want to go into uh, or may may want to go uh, into into uh, technical uh, uh, professions they may be uh, scared by the fact that uh, yeah technology causes pollution uh, it may not be sufficiently attractive financially it's too complex uh, i mean chat gpt will solve our problems these are some 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 uh, some things that we have to be careful about uh, so, what are the challenges? Uh, are we open to challenge ourselves? This is one question. But also, how should we communicate to uh, to to other to these other um, publics, to the other communities? Is is a real question. And I have for you a, a questionnaire. And now I have. This is perhaps um, no. This is what I, not what I wanted to do. Um, I just want to uh, invite you. Uh, to click on this on this link and to reply to the question that is being asked, which is what are the challenges that you perceive in thermodynamics and transport properties? Uh, this is kind of a way to to start our discussion uh, before I finalize my my talk. Uh, but I believe it would be nice if you could uh, write down a few keywords. That that you believe are are of importance, uh, such that we can, um, uh, yeah, uh, promote uh, thermodynamics further in our um, in in, uh, in in different communities as as a working party or as a uh, uh, federation of chemical engineers. You know what are the 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 challenges that you perceive? So I don't know. I don't see that anybody uh, has. Uh, joined the the link yet, but if yes, some one person okay has managed to to come in. Two persons have managed to come in. So uh, yes, I, I I like to have uh, some some input, just yeah to have some some ideas of what you believe are the challenges um, in in our field of thermodynamics and transport properties. Uh, this would be nice if you can. This is wonderful. It comes in. It comes in. Here you have here you have the the input of what of what you're telling me, telling us. So this is this is very nice. This is very nice. We see that models industry uh, are, are coming up as 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 big elements that we may want to consider 
uh, in improving thermodynamics and transport properties. This is, this is, I like this. So we have 14 people uh, joining. So I have another question for you. Uh, data models, yes, yes, yes. You can, you can put several, uh, several of the keywords at once and just click on, on, on uh, validate to, um, this, is, this is great. Okay, data and models. See, I mean, we are, we are right on the, on the spot data and models, I really like that. But we will, we will look at, 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 more, at more of these of these questions. I have another question for you, which is the next one. Uh, what do you think of academic education in thermodynamics and transport properties? Can you say, uh, hand in a few, a few key words on thermodynamic education? Uh, same story, uh, use the same link. Uh, you just continue. Um, yeah, you should use the same link. Normally, the the same link should should work. Uh, and if you provide some some inputs, okay. Here you have share some of uh, of, of your inputs. Okay. On education, we like the word application. That is very interesting. More practical examples, real world cases, too theoretical, far away from reality. Okay, so this is a message to all our uh, collaborators who are teaching. Um, yeah, there is a clear need of, of working more on application and on, uh, on, on uh, finding uh, examples, practical examples, computations, too theoretical, too little. Okay. <laughs> there is too little of this. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for people who are answering. And uh, a third question, the third question is uh, related, but this is the, here, here you have to just tell us, uh, tell us um, uh, among in, in this, in this list, uh, what are the priority communities that you should that you feel should be addressed first to make them aware of the need for thermodynamic development? Uh, should we address the general public for the reason that I mentioned, which is that they are influencing somehow the uh, the uh, they are influencing the the, the the final choice of funding, but they are, they are also influencing the political decisions at the end. Uh, and I believe that we are very much uh, uh, subject to, um, yeah, to political uh, decision makers. Uh, high school students, that is more for uh, promoting, um, I would say, uh, uh, the, the, them for, for, yeah, making, encouraging them to, 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 go, to go into engineering studies. Uh, private management would mean uh, uh, promoting, uh, uh, industrial expertise, uh, I think it's also important. Uh, public decision makers, um, so that is more for funding, um, for funding, for public funding, uh, or perhaps other engineering practitioners. Because sometimes, um, well, I haven't, uh, I haven't allowed for for you to name them, but you can perhaps name them in the chat. Um, it's sometimes it's important to uh, to have more. Uh, cross collaboration between with other engineering practitioners, because solutions may exist in one field uh, for questions that may exist in another field. And if we don't collaborate among engineers, uh, well, we might not uh, find the, 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 the innovative solutions that we are searching for. So I believe we also have some, some yeah. outcome. Of so this, Charles, yes, me. and in I'm stopping here. I'm yes. stopping here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stopping here. Uh, I had the last slide, but uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to 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 leave it for later uh, regarding regarding uh, computers versus humans. But I think uh, we have we have uh, sufficient. Uh, so I stop it. If yes. you have another QR code, you can just uh, uh, show it and. No, can... this was my last QR code. Okay, yeah. okay. okay. I just had the last slide, uh, which uh, essentially, uh, uh, well, 
pr provide some some conclusions on computers versus humans. Uh, what are the qualities of a computer? It manipulates a large amount of data, is fast, provides numbers, and so on. So we know computers. But what is a human? A human is should be critical. Should be because he is not always. But uh, I think I think that's what we can bring to 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 our AI society. Uh, it's, it's curious. It's inspired. I think that is one of the key words that I like very much. Inspiration. Uh, of course, human is lazy and is slow. We all know that. Uh, but then also humans are social. And that is something of another dimension that we need to uh, take into account, I believe, uh, very much so in the future. Uh, it's part of a community. We have we can collaborate for a common goal. Uh, and but but communications may be complex, so we need to be able to communicate among among humans. So both are needed, uh, but it is up to human to provide directions. So with that, I I will stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for being too long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maybe we can uh, maybe we can uh, uh, encourage now. First of all, thanks to all the speakers. I think this is, was a very representative and very broad overview of all the issues that we have currently in uh, applied thermodynamics. And um, yeah, maybe we can uh, we can encourage now the audience to ask their more technical questions, and then maybe we can show in the last in the th three or four minutes we can uh, uh, we can show the results of the survey of the online survey, uh, Jean Charles, just to wrap up. Yep. Uh, I saw so, there was uh, there was a question in the chat before I saw it, and it was maybe for Anton. Have you seen it? Uh, a question from yes. Alec Alexis. Yes, and the question is, uh, uh, what do you believe we need to focus on in the near future? Because you've touched uh, many fronts, you've opened many fronts. Uh, but uh, is it improved accuracy or is it improved flexibility uh, in order to be able to transition from the traditional oil and gas industry to an industry more focused on uh, renewable feedstocks? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, it's an excellent uh, question. Uh, and of course, uh, I will try, well, I can give you my personal opinion, of course, but it's, uh, I think it's more interesting to see what is, uh, what would be in, in general. Um, I think if we talk about accuracy, uh, I think it's a must anyways. Uh, so you, is, is, is there an option uh, not to have uh, accurate uh, data? I, I don't think uh, we have that option. Um, you talk about modeling, uh, so it's about the representation of the actual data. Yeah, that the, depends a little bit on your application, what kind of accuracy uh, you need. But I think uh, it would be very good if we would have models that also indicate what is the accuracy. And typically, we are very happy with the model uh, just providing an output, uh, and, and then we have a value. But much better if we would have an indicator like flagging. Well, this 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 is very accurate, or this is not. Uh, so that's an area where, where I think it would be good to have improvements. Uh, coming in from industry, I think actually um, having models available uh, that helps us to shift from uh, the fossil base to a renewable is is very important. Um, I don't know whether you want me uh, to say uh, this one or that one, uh, but then I'm more leaning towards uh, uh, a system where we focus on the renewable. Yeah, but uh, that's uh, more my opinion. I'm curious okay. to hear uh, what others would think about it. Well, of course, the the the, the bio. <clears throat> engineering let's say applications is also very uh, broad uh, uh, frontier and um, um, a very compelling one we have seen uh, with COVID for instance uh, how important it is to have data and to share data and to have common information reliable information on viruses and you know many also physical quantities uh, which uh, define some uh, uh, biological molecules. So I think this is also a very 
very hot topic for the new researchers at least uh, to, to follow and uh, and in the end they are all you know thermophysical properties as Richard was uh, was saying before so yeah um other questions from the audience I can I can also can I comment about yeah, this sure. accuracy uh, my observation from collecting data uh, there are there are these new fields from pharmaceuticals or deaths and my observation is many newcomers come to this field and uh, the quality of this field uh, needs some improvement both from the modeling part and also from data acquisition part and that is why kind of I agree with uh, Jean Charles that education is really important for these new fields uh, because uh, traditional fields are more kind of uh, kind, kind of they have traditions of high quality measurements but this new field kind of needs some kind of educations from from those who do this for years to the, to 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 improve the situation yeah maybe there should be also more permeability between different communities and maybe. also between different journals uh, for instance, in, in our chemical engineering journals, especially those that are focused on data, there is a certain standard on, you know, on uh, on data quality. But in in other uh, less traditional journals, maybe there is no such standard. Uh, and so, of course, more communication with other communities, I think, is essential. And uh, and I think that the, the satellite uh, session that we are hosting in. Uh, uh, next ECC conference in Berlin, which is focused on pharmaceutical applications, may also open uh, and uh, you know and, and support this this discussion and this communication between different areas. Um, yeah, Maria, Maria Gracia. I, regarding one of your comments earlier, you were giving the example of of uh, medicines. Uh, there is a question of speed, which we never really look at i would say i mean uh, not to not that i'm aware of uh in in our community speed of communication uh in terms of uh, of, of data you know uh, it's true that in, in, in medical uh, sector uh, you need to have the data uh, and the sooner it's out the better um I, I, uh, it's a question, <laughs> okay? I, I'm not sure that it's 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 uh, it's the necessarily the best way to uh, the, to to communicate, uh, but it is true that there is um, sometimes uh, the need for, uh, and it may come become even more stringent in the future, uh, uh, that uh, if you want to um, to collaborate on on data, um, well, we need to to collaborate to to, to share the data. Uh, quick, quickly. Yes. Well, and also in a universal format. <laughs> and in a format that everybody can can reach and they know how, where to get it. <laughs> yes, I think that I think the European Union, but also other countries, have done a lot in supporting open science and uh, promoting uh, the publication of of data on open repositories. Uh, and now I think this was a, a necessary prerequisite. And now. The second step is to make all this data usable by uh, the largest possible uh, community, and so uh, uh, follow what what Ala was saying uh, and adhere maybe to this you know these new communities that are forming about fair uh, publication of uh, of data and others that are, that are also very active now, and especially for the development of machine learning, because this is of course of uh, essential uh, in order to build the databases. Uh, Richard, you wanted to say something? Yes. Yes. Uh, when it comes to uh, data, especially bio data, I just wanted to make an observation that I went through as part of this PGL effort. You know, we're looking for data everywhere. And of course, bio data is hot. You know, we'd love to be able to address that. And, and so, we found a database about solubility measurements that was being used in the bio community. And so I analyzed that database. There were some machine learning articles being published. Well, in that community, plus or minus 5x uncertainty is considered good. You can't even distinguish the difference between liquid liquid equilibria versus solid liquid equilibria which one is it actually being? 
with that level of error. And so I would say that that might be too quick, <laughs> okay? There needs to be a little more focus. I was kind of disappointed and, and maybe a little retroactively impressed with the petrochemical community in that regard because plus or minus 5x solubility on benzene and water would never be accepted. <laughs> Nobody would accept even begin yeah. like that. And, and so that's fine for all the drugs you want to put in your body, though. Uh, I'm not 100% comfortable with that. And, and so some, somebody needs to communicate to the bio community that, that this isn't good enough. That, that's just the comment that came to my mind from Charles. Oh, okay. okay. I, 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 we have a question for Ala from the audience. And uh, this is a very specific question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, why is some data at the NIST website are not available for use in academic environment? Uh, it's an in, in, interesting question because, uh, um, uh, first of all, websites we provide are available to everyone, and uh, the subscription based. Uh, many universities have subscribed to those uh, to to WTT, and many universities use this. If you have any specific questions, please write to me, and I will try to understand what what uh, if your your specific uh, university doesn't have access to this. I will try to understand why. So please contact me directly, okay. because it, it is supposed to be available uh, if it's uh, subscription based. Uh, you need a subscription, or it's 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 if it's if it's free, it's available to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the... Yes, Richard, I, I, please go I, on. I could add one more comment to that. Um, in you know Vladimir Dicky. Is with Miss TRC, and he's the second author in PGL. So we developed a, a number of tools in that um, interaction, collaboration, that are actually open source. And and so I wanted to make sure that people were aware of that. And and one that I don't know if it could be or may become uh, openly available is this uh, PGL DLL that uh, Vladimir and I worked on. And and so all the well, not all, but very many, most of the models that we evaluated, we have open source code uh, available. And then we wrap that code into a, a DLL that's interfaced then with the uh, TDE interface. And so as far as I'm concerned, that could certainly be made freely available either as a DLL. And then of course you have all the source code if you want it. Okay, thanks. Uh, there is another question uh, uh, in the chat, but it is very long uh, and very, very technical and specific, and, and it is for Dr. Ala Basileva. So I suggest the attendee to contact directly uh, Dr. Basileva because she has provided her direct email very, very kindly. So please contact her because this is a very long and time consuming question to answer now. So I'd rather use this uh, last couple of minutes to wrap up. Uh, because we are coming to an end. Maybe Jean-Charles, you have something to add about uh, the results of our online survey? Uh, well, we, we, we've, we've seen that together, in fact. Uh, it's quite interesting to find a, a number of uh, uh, outcomes that are, I mean, what are the challenges for thermodynamics? The big, the key words that come up are models and data. So that, that, yeah. that uh, yeah, and in models, you can say simulation, you can say collaboration is, of course, one of the keywords that, that came up as well. Uh, about the question regarding teaching, uh, I see a lot of uh, keywords about application, um, uh, yeah, practical examples. Uh, okay, so it's make, it, make it as practical as possible so, so that people can, uh, uh, can, can understand what it's, what it's about. Uh, and the last question that I asked regarding what community should be addressed first, um, well, I would say that a very slight, a slight uh, majority for the public decision makers, but private management is almost uh, equal. Um, the, then the high school students is, is important. Other practi practitioner engineer, engineers are also important. And the general public, apparently it's not as priority. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that is the, the, the yeah. The no one, no one wants 
to take the responsibility to, to communicate. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, yes. Thermodynamics yeah. <laughs> to the wider It's more public. difficult. It is a very it difficult. It is very task. challenging. It is, it is very challenging. It is, it is. But decision makers <laughs> in general is, is, is yes. really the big, uh, big thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so with this, uh, uh, I would like to thank the speakers again. So we have touched uh, many, many different topics. Uh, I think that we can conclude that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, work to do for us still. Uh, so thermodynamics is evolving, is a constantly evolving discipline. And uh, yeah, we, we will, of course, propose uh, another Another webinar in the next uh, in the next edition of the EFC. I would like to thank EFC for hosting and organizing so well this uh, this series of webinars. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Martin.